Well, good afternoon, brethren. Hopefully that was enough time to collect the offering. I hope you are having a good first day of unleavened bread, and if you are, that would be the result of God's Spirit working with us and the preparation that you have sown in days and weeks prior. So for learning, <clears throat> God gives us these festivals. In addition to words, he also instructs us with tangible symbols. In the Passover service, we conceivably could learn something about humility and being cleansed and the sacrifice of the body and blood of Jesus Christ without foot washing or unleavened bread and wine. But God gave those specific instructions and physical items and physical actions to enhance our spiritual learning. And that these items and actions involve symbolic and metaphorical meaning, which add to our, to our understanding. So prior to these seven days, you would have thrown out all visible leavened bread in your quarters. And for the next seven days, we're going to do our best to abstain from leavened bread. And not only that, during these seven days, when we do eat bread or some kind of baked good made with grain, it will be unleavened. And that's all for our learning. So what is the object lesson of leavened bread and unleavened bread? And why do we have this tangible symbol and metaphor of leavened and unleavened bread? I'm going to give a definition from Wikipedia because I think this is a pretty good definition of the term object lesson. An object lesson is a teaching method that consists of using a physical object or visual aid as a discussion piece for a lesson. Object lesson teaching assumes that material things have the potential to convey information. So the object of the object lesson is leavened bread and unleavened bread. And what the lessons are, we'll cover in this message. Now, God didn't pull the object of the object lesson out of thin air. There is, is historical basis when Israel was finally sent out of Egypt after that 10th plague and Exodus 12 34 says so the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their clothes on their shoulders in other words they had to leave Egypt in a big hurry and there wasn't time to leaven the dough so in this message today, I want to review and discuss some of the symbolism and meaning regarding the days of unleavened bread. We can title the message lessons from the symbolism of the days of unleavened bread. And I want to cover the topic in the following way. We'll spend most of our time using 1 Corinthians 5 as a launching pad and uh, into other scriptures to explain the meaning of the symbolism of the days of un un unleavened bread. Number two, we'll discuss some practicalities of the object lesson. And number three, we'll briefly look at how we are to be unleavened. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Mr. Gardenhire covered some of this ground a few weeks ago. But we're going to look at this passage because it's so fundamental to the days of unleavened bread. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 says, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, but with the leaven of malice, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. By the way, in this whole epistle of 1 Corinthians, Paul is pointing out lots of problems with the Corinthian congregation. 
There's a lot of correction in this epistle. And in the early part of chapter 5, Paul chastises the Corinthians for their tolerance of a major case of immorality that would scandalize even the pagans. And he recommends out of love that the unrepentant person be expelled from the congregation so that eventually he may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So the verses that we read are very remarkable because it provides us so, so much information. Uh, number one, this is an epistle mainly to a Gentile church. And we find references to Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread as if the audience needed no background explanation. So they had been taught about this festival. And so Jesus Christ is referenced as the Passover, in other words, the Paschal Lamb. And it sounds like a reminder, not an unfamiliar concept. The concept of leavened and unleavened are clearly mentioned in this passage in a way that assumes familiarity. Number two, the passage clearly indicates that this mainly Gentile congregation was observing or going to observe this festival time. That's why Paul says, let us keep the feast. And that's an encouragement to keep the feast in its deep intended meaning in the proper frame of mind. So you cannot argue that Paul told congregations to disregard the festivals as, lo as no longer applicable. As we can see, Paul discusses understanding of the meaning of these days in light of the work of Jesus Christ. Number three, a meaning of the metaphor of leavened and unleavened bread is explained in this passage and perhaps more directly and more fully than anywhere else in scripture. So let's look at those three verses again. In verse six, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians five, verse six, he's making an obvious observation that anybody in society could understand. Leaven in the form of some starter dough, when mixed in with a large lump, causes a rising action of the dough and in the final baked product. It does not take much leaven to leaven a sizable lump. Verse 7 says that the individual Christian is to clean out the old leaven. You can think of it as tossing out the old starter dough. Instead, we're to be a lump that is unleavened. So note in this passage, the specific language is not aimed at eating unleavened bread. The focus here, Paul is characterizing that the Christian is the unleavened lump. And he adds the reason that we can be un the unleavened lump is because Christ, our sacrifice, our Passover sacrifice has been sacrificed. So an idea that the days of unleavened bread are all about how we clean ourselves up all on our own is off base. Because without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins, we would have no hope in ever being that unleavened lump. But then after that, we have a tremendous role to play in our daily lives, as brought out by Mr. Butler's message with the help of the Holy Spirit to remain unleavened. And it takes thinking and effort, as Mr. Butler mentioned. So I'll add that being that unleavened lump not only relies on the reality that our Savior suffered and died for us, but that we have a living Savior. And he was res resurrected to life. And that resurrection occurred right in the middle of the days of unleavened bread. So we have that important reality of the resurrection associated with this festival. I could say more about that, but just wait till Saturday in our weekly Sabbath and we'll hear messages that go further into the connection of the days of unleavened bread and the resurrection. Verse 8. That verse made clear some associations of the example of malice and wickedness with old leaven and sincerity and truth as examples with the unleavened. And so we'll see further 
that the representation of the leaven to be cast out is broader than just malice and wickedness. It's sin and evil deception in general, sinful thoughts, sinful behavior, sinful words, sinful attitudes, Satan's deception, the world's deception. And what's represented by the unleavened lump is broader. It's the total opposite of the things I just mentioned. It would be righteousness, godliness, and the full understanding of how to love God and how to love neighbor. So going back to verse 6, Paul said, a little corruption, a little deception, a little sin can leaven the whole lump. So we do have to watch. So let's discuss some other places in the Bible where leaven is used as a symbol of something that corrupts or something that is false. And when leaven represents these kinds of things, we must pay attention for this is the old leaven that we want to clean out. I already read one verse from Exodus 12, and you can find the similar instruction in Deuteronomy 16. These are instructions about not eating leavened bread and not eating, about not eating leavened bread and eating unleavened bread during the seven days of the festival of unleavened bread. Because as I said, Egypt, Israel had to leave Egypt in a hurry. And the instruction was prior to the days of unleavened bread to remove leaven so that it was not found in the territory of Israel during those seven days. So the symbolism of leaven represents something to be cleaned out. And at least in this Exodus account, there is no specific mention of sin being associated with leaven, but the Bible interprets itself. So now let's go to Leviticus 2 verse 11. Leviticus 2.11 is talking about the grain offering, and it simply says, Leviticus 2.11, No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. And the connected verse would be Leviticus 6.17. Leviticus 6.17, and that says, and it's also about the grain offering. It shall not be baked with leaven. So leaven was forbidden in all the grain offerings to the Lord. And given that these offerings point to Christ, leaven would, be, would represent something that is not associated with Jesus Christ, that's inconsistent with Jesus Christ. From the rest of Scripture, we would understand that to be sin. Now let me go to Luke chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. We're going to go over two of the passages that discuss when Christ made a reference to leaven with respect to the Pharisees and the religious leaders. The first one of the two is Luke chapter 12, 1 to 2. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, they began to say to his disciples, first of all, or so he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So here that metaphor of leaven is clearly something that is not good. And Jesus assumes his disciples understand that leaven represents sin or something that corrupts. This word hypocrisy in the Greek is hypocrisis. Mr. Gardenhire talked about it three weeks ago. The word means Acting, it means play acting, stage acting, a pretense or a feigning. Now the word today in our English is a little is used a little more broadly, and sometimes that term hypocrite is thrown at a person who transgresses out of weakness, even though they're trying to do what's right, but they find out that they're weak 
But the key element of the Greek word hypocrisy, again, is pretense and play acting, not slipping up or being easily deceived. Now, it is a problem to be weak, and we would want to deal with that, and we want to make sure that we're not relying on our own strength. And being easily deceived is a problem, and we would want to deal with that. And thus, we need to be grounded in the truth and use the resources that God has supplied us. But what Jesus was saying is those Pharisees, many of them were play-acting. So he's saying to his disciples, beware of that. You don't want to follow that example in the least. Beware, because they may not be trustworthy. And we find some examples of that in Matthew 23. And we have a full chapter of very strong words against scribes and Pharisees that show their hypocrisy. Now, by me pointing to them, this is not intended to be a session of beating up on long dead Pharisees. By reading this, we want to check up on ourselves to see if any of this leaven is within us and look to see if it applies to us. So we're looking at Matthew 23 and we'll look at a few verses. Let's look at verse 13, first of all, Matthew 23, 13. Matthew 23, 13 says, For woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor you allow, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. You might be reminded of the medical ethics precept, which is, at first, do no harm. Well, the Pharisees were not helping. They were not just doing, nor were they doing no harm. They were hurting. They were blocking people from accessing the kingdom of God, and in particular, the divine being from that kingdom who came to earth born as a man. We would never want to be an obstacle to anyone who is accessing the kingdom of God. Verse 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' homes and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So evidently, they were filled with greed, scheming somehow to acquire widows' homes. I don't know if we know what the scheme was, but that's not important. Christ is highlighting that they were Filled with greed. In Luke, the Pharisees were described as lovers of money. And we know the love of money, not money itself, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And we don't want to be filled with this kind of greed or love of money. Verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much of a son of hell as yourselves. So they employed energy and effort, perhaps misdirected, and they had a corrupting influence on others. So a convert was supposedly made, but that convert wasn't taught righteousness and a relationship with God. So we don't want to follow that example. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Major principle talked about here, where they neglected justice, mercy, and faith, and we certainly don't want to leave those kinds of weightier things undone. And verse 24, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What a word picture. We're talking about formalistic obedience that misses the big picture. So you can imagine a Pharisee with a little mesh. He's trying to strain out 
the water so that he doesn't accidentally consume that unclean gnat. But Christ in the word picture says he missed the camel. So even during these days of unleavened bread, we focus on the physical unleavened bread and avoid the leavened bread. But we should not miss the more important spiritual analogies. In other words, the spiritual meaning behind just abstaining from leavened bread and consuming the unleavened bread. And then I'll just read verses 25 to 29 because this illustrates more about hypocrisy. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. So these are all examples of what not to be. Now let me go to the other example of Christ's use of the symbol of leaven to represent sin, and that would be Matthew 16. Matthew 16, and let's look at verses 6 and 7. Matthew 16, 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, is it because we have taken no bread? Then verse 11 and 12, how is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So again, the association of leaven is to something that's not good. It's something to watch out for. Jesus said, beware of their doctrine. Now the Greek word there translated as doctrine. We think of doctrine as just some formal list of beliefs, but the Greek word mean, is more general. It means teaching. So beware of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And why? Because some of it is wrong, misguided, unsound, off base, not true, and not necessarily in any minor inconsequential way, but in a way that will get you off God's intended path. You know, it's hard to find someone who's wrong about everything. The typical case is falsehood mixed with truth. So Jesus could have been referring to their misinterpretations of scripture, their adding on and loading on of man-made traditions that distorted, distorted God's intent of the law, and other teachings and ideas that were directly contrary to God's law and God's will. Just a couple examples. One example of the Pharisees' leaven of false teaching was when some Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus Christ about divorce in Matthew 19.3. You don't need to turn there. But there was a school of thought at that time among some of the Pharisees that a man could divorce his wife for any reason. And Jesus Christ had to correct this notion by taking them back to the beginning and first principles of what God's intent was when he made male and female and marriage. Another example of the Pharisees' false teaching is in Mark 7, 11. You don't need to turn there. But in Mark 7, 11, Christ chastised them for putting more importance on a discretionary gift to the temple, which was called Corban, and instead neglecting 
their parents who were in need. Christ said they were not fulfilling the commandment to honor thy father and your mother. And perhaps one of the reasons that they would prioritize the Corbin contribution over aiding one's needy parents was that they loved the acclaim that the giving of Corbin would have gathered to them. Other examples of their false teaching involved the Sabbath. There were several times on how, several examples of how the Pharisees had issue with how Christ and his disciples observed the Sabbath, including the healing of bodies and minds on the Sabbath. Jesus Christ observed the Sabbath without fault. Their humanly devised regulations and traditions put a straitjacket on the Sabbath that squished the joy out of the day that God intended. Jesus had to remind them that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He was the Lord of the Sabbath after all. So we can be comfortable in our assumptions and in our way of reasoning, but it's better to seek God's view on the matter. But now let me look at one more serious example of the leaven of false teaching of the Pharisees, and that would be, let's see, Matthew 9, Matthew chapter 9, verses 33 and 34. Matthew 9, 33 and 34. And Matthew 9, verse 33 says, And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, that was the mute man spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never like, seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. What could be more false than denying who Jesus Christ was and the power through which he accomplished his ministry and instead ascribe it to Satan? So those are just some of many examples of the false teachings of the Pharisees. We would know that if you only listen to the Pharisees at the time, you would have gotten a wrong idea on Jesus Christ. They tried to paint, portray Christ as a glutton and a wine-bibber just because he associated or was ministering to those that they considered sinners. And they continued to make false insinuations against him. One suggested at one point, no prophet comes out of Galilee. That particular leader forgot about Jonah, but the point was they were just throwing words around to discourage people from belief in Christ. So in the New Testament, we see Levin picturing false teaching, hypocrisy, corrupt actions, and sin like malice and wickedness. So now I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 5, 8 and just pick up some additional points. Because I'm going to ask, why are malice and wickedness used as examples of the old leaven that was to be cleaned out? Well, we don't need to look in... Well, actually, I will point you to... Let's go to chapter 1. This is 1 Corinthians 1, 11 to 12. Because in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3, Paul is spending a lot of time correcting the Corinthians on the issue of partisanship and contentions. So 1 Corinthians 1, 11 and 12 just gives us a flavor. Verse 1, sorry, chapter 1, verse 11. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say that, that, I say this, that each of you says, I am a Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Now let me go to chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 4. 
chapter 3, verse 1 says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you still are not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, another, I am of Paulos, are you not carnal? So it is interesting that malice is written down as one of the examples in chapter 5 of the leaven to be tossed out. Because with all this party spirit and quarreling, there likely was a lot of malice towards one another. We ourselves today have to watch our speech and our actions and our thoughts that they do not reflect malice. And the best way to do that is to quench malice when it first enters our thoughts. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter five, which we read verses six through eight, in verses one through five, Paul talks about that egregious case of sexual immorality when a man had relations with his father's wife, or in other words, his stepmother. And that depraved wickedness is, or let's put it this way, that is depraved wickedness, and it's interesting that Paul uses wickedness as, as, as that second example of leaven, of old leaven. In chapter 5, for the unleavened lump, he uses two examples, sincerity and truth. And I just find it interesting, and it's purely an observation, but we cover two cases where Jesus said to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And those two examples were hypocrisy and false teaching. So I find it interesting that Paul used an example of being unleavened that happens to be the exact opposite of the two examples of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In other words, sincerity is the direct opposite of hypocrisy. And truth is the direct opposite of false teaching. So whether Paul had some access to earlier versions of the Gospels as source material, or whether he got that instruction right from Jesus Christ? That's an open question. We don't have the answer to that. But I find it wonderful how God has connected the books of the Bible and how all these words are inspired. One more major point about 1 Corinthians 5, because it illustrates the principle that just having the leavened bread put away is not sufficient. It has to be replaced by the unleavened lump. So we just can't just put away sin. Sin must be replaced by something else. And Christ illustrated that in Matthew 12, 43 to 45. Matthew 12, 43 to 45. And Matthew 12, 43 says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, put in order. Verse 45, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So Christ could have been describing the attitude of Israel throughout their history and the situation of Israel at the time he was speaking. And he was describing the attitude of the religious leaders as a whole. There were times in Israel's history when idolatry was cleaned out. But was it truly replaced with love for God and obedience to his way? So again, cleaning up one's life and ceasing to commit sin, but not filling one's life with God leaves plenty of room for Satan's influence to come back in.
The old saying applies, nature abhors a vacuum. The Life Application Bible notes say, ridding our lives of sin is the first step. We must also take the second step, filling our lives with God's word and the Holy Spirit. Unfilled and complacent people are easy targets for Satan. Now, we are supposed to be the unleavened lump. Did we unleaven ourselves? I sort of touched upon this earlier. No, that's not the case. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ justifies and cleanses, but then we have the responsibility and role to allow, God's, to allow God through his Holy Spirit to continue the process of being unleavened. So if you take that other metaphor of eating the unleavened bread, and that does picture the ingesting of the bread of life, putting on Christ, in other words, being filled with Jesus Christ. Let me go to Ephesians chapter 4 to give some concrete examples from Paul about how we need to not only cast out sin, but to replace it with the action of God. Ephesians 4, let's start with verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17 says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles in the futility of their mind. Now let's skip to Ephesians 4, verse 22 to 24. That you put off concerning your formal, former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So get rid of the old man, and not only that, put on the new man as a replacement. Another analogy, but same principle. Now let's go to verse 28 to get to the concrete examples. Verse 28, Ephesians 4, 28. Let him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. So stop stealing. And you know what? That's what a thief does when he's on vacation. But you know that thief is no longer a thief when he starts doing honest work and he shares what he honestly gains with others in need. So it's not just about discarding the leavened bread of theft, but consuming the unleavened bread of honest work and sharing with others. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. So not just the discarding of the leaven of unwholesome talk, but replacing it with encouragement helpful words that build up others. Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Not just dis discarding the unleavened bread of bitterness, anger, brawling, slander, malice, but you replace it with kindness, compassion, the willingness to forgive. And you can take any of the Ten Commandments. I'll just take one as an example. Thou shalt not steal. The big, full intent of that simple statement, that simple law, is to protect the value of my neighbor's property. Not only just not steal, but to uphold my neighbor's property. So whether I use a public or a private resource, I should aim to leave it as good or better condition than when I first found it. So we've delved into 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8 for what it teaches about the meaning of the symbols of being unleavened and leavened. And we've covered related principles. So now I'm gonna get into part two.
And let me tell you, part two is a lot, lot shorter than part one, and part three is even shorter than part two. So we will, I won't hold you till five o'clock. Part two is on the practicality as the object lesson of the days of unleavened bread. Now, some get the idea that we don't even need this object lesson anymore because Christ's sacrifice is complete. That thought misses the role that we play in becoming more like Jesus Christ. Since we're not yet perfect and still have to deal with sin in our lives, the object lesson of not eating the leavened bread and taking on the unleavened bread remains. Because who among us can say that we're perfect and thus no longer need the physical object lesson of the leavened and unleavened bread? Who can say discarding and disposing of the leaven is no longer relevant because we're already perfect? Who can say we do not need to take in more of the righteousness of Christ because we're already so filled with his righteousness already? Don't need any more. So I think the point is understood. The care that you will take in watching out for the leaven products models real life where we have responsibility for what enters our mind or what remains in our minds. The forethought that you will employ as you plan your meals this week or select a restaurant will model real life where we do have to prepare to help us avoid sin. That you may find to your chagrin 11 product in your pantry or your refrigerator this week models real life. That you look at the ingredients list of a product that you always assumed was unleavened and then you actually find that there's leaven, that models real life. And when we're busy and multitasking and someone at work is passing around a plate of leaven cookies and we just grab one out of habit and start eating, that models real life too. On the other hand, partaking of unleavened products models that we want to partake of the bread of life. And seeking out unleavened bread and even taking the effort to make our own unleavened bread recipes models the spiritual enthusiasm and effort that we would want to employ in our lives. Now, I did get one, I did get one question before the days of unleavened bread. Someone asked me, should we be putting toppings on our unleavened bread? Doesn't that take away from the purpose of unleavened bread? Well, let's understand that the bread that we'll be eating and snacking on for the next seven days is not sacramental. I'll explain that. The unleavened bread is an object lesson and a teaching tool. In contrast, that bread at the Passover service that was on the plate was specifically blessed for a special purpose. And if there was any leftover bread on that plate, the instruction is to burn it or dispose of it so that it cannot be used. The same applies for the wine. Any of the wine that was in the cups that was blessed and that was not consumed would be disposed of. Now, if one consumed the bread or wine at Passover in a careless manner, in a negligent manner, not thinking about what it all means, that's a big problem. Because 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the possible consequences of that. But for the next seven days, if you just happen to consume some unleavened product this week and in a particular instant, you didn't think about Christ and his righteousness necessarily, that's not an issue because the unleavened bread we're consuming this week is an object lesson. It's not sacramental in the way that the Passover bread was. Now again, we should be taking advantage of this object lesson repeatedly and thoroughly. So in response to the person who asked me, Feel free to put the jam and the butter and your favorite topping on your unleavened cracker. Now, if someone 
put a tasty topping on the piece of bread that was on the Passover plate, that would be completely inappropriate. But it's fine to put your tasty spreads on your unleavened bread this week as you eat and snack for the next seven days while learning the object lesson. So that was part two about some practicalities involving the object lesson for the next seven days. Finally, part three. This is an analogy to unleavened bread that is not specifically referred to in the Bible, but I think it's instructive. Years ago, at a night to be much observed, someone made the comment, and I don't think it was, it was meant to be a pun, but someone said, the days of unleavened bread are not stale. And I remembered that. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19. Yeah, at least a few people in the audience think it was as humorous uh, as when I first heard it. The days of unleavened bread are not stale. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So the ingesting of the unleavened bread this week reminds us of taking in of the bread of life, since we do not live by physical bread alone. But it's also a reminder that the unleavened bread can represent us, since 1 Corinthians 5 talked about we being the unleavened lump. After Christ has made us unleavened, we aim to remain unleavened even though we will stumble along the way. All right, not an unfamiliar sight during this week. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be the unleavened bread you eat during this week. But this is one example of it, a matzo cracker. And a matzo right out of the box, especially when it's never been opened, is fresh, crisp, aromatic, and flavorful. Now, I actually know very few Chinese words, but there is a Chinese word that I can think of that encompasses all four aspects. But in English, we have the words separately, you know, fresh, crisp, aromatic, and flavorful. When my late grandmother first came to America and sampled a package of potato chips right out of the bag, she used that Chinese word. And she meant all four, fresh, crisp, aromatic, and flavorful. So despite the physical challenges that we may have, and some of them come upon us through sickness and disease or, and, and age, we should aim to be like matzo, out of the box, fresh, not stale. And once that spiritual aspect of our lives has been refreshed or freshened, other aspects of our lives can take on a new vitality. So perhaps we've been in the faith 10, 20, 30, 50 years or more. And if we've lost some of the excitement and enthusiasm or the appreciation of being that new creation where all things have become new, this festival is an excellent time and opportunity to refresh in that spiritual vitality by allowing the Holy Spirit to work even more in you.
And as a result, these days will certainly not be the days of stale, unleavened bread, but fresh and crisp and aromatic and flavorful. So in conclusion, may God bless all of us during these days of unleavened bread so that we can learn more deeply from the symbolism and object lesson of unleavened bread.